Go hunting with Bob and Ben, the show which takes you all across America in appreciation and in pursuit of nature's wildlife. What do you get when an educated Yankee hunter teams up with a southern hardcore hunting country boy? Well, you just might get the best darn hunting show ever filmed if the Yankee happens to be Bob McGuire, hunting naturalist and cinematographer, and the southern boy happens to be Ben Rogers Lee, world champion turkey caller and hunter. On today's show, we visit with a bow hunting legend, Fred Bear. Fred talks about how he first started bow hunting and shares some of his favorite hunting experiences. We see footage from his brown bear hunt where he killed the number two record book Kodiak bear. Then we learn about white-tailed deer rut behavior and breeding habits. Finally, we invest in the future as Fred passes on a legacy. Start them right and start them young. The bow hunter, tough, patient, skilled. He enters the woods on a nearly equal basis with the game he hunts. When the chance comes, he must have confidence in himself, in his equipment. That's why experienced bow hunters like Jim Doherty put their confidence in Hoyt Easton's powerful, precise Rambo compound bow and Easton Aluminum's XX75 camo hunter arrows. They'll give you all the confidence you need. After all, an entire hunting trip can come down to just one precise shot. Boy, if you get you some liberty overalls, that wouldn't happen to you. Until I found liberty, I spent more time hunting good hunting clothes than I did hunting. When you hunters buy liberty overalls this fall, watch for some premium offers on Ben Lee hunting products. Next time you go shopping for hunting clothes, specify liberty. They're worth hunting for. Hi folks, I'm Ben Lee, world champion turkey caller. And I've got a few of my turkey hunting products today that's going to help make you a better turkey hunter. First, I have the twin hen turkey call. Real simple to use and real easy to use. If you want a, a good turkey hunting product, then you might want to try the super hen. The super hen is very easy to use. It's one of the best friction callers on today's market. Then we have the cassette tape. The cassette tape gives complete instructions on turkey hunting and turkey calling. This is something that you might want to try. Then, we've got my favorite call, the Widowmaker Turkey Hub Call. It's the hardest call to master, but by far the most realistic. And then if you're into the mouth callers, we have single reeds, double reeds, and triple reeds. And remember folks, when you're ordering turkey callers, specify standard frame or small frame, and specify single reed, double reed, or triple reed. You told me the first time you ever went whitetail deer hunting when you was working up there in one of them factories, and you went out and you sat down and daylight came and you shot a 200-something pound buck, and yeah. you wasn't in the woods but five minutes, and you said, there's got to be more to hunting than this, so you took up archery. Yeah, that's, that's really what happened. It was 1933. I shot the biggest buck I'd ever shot, and the biggest buck really I've ever seen. It dressed out 285 pounds. Good God. Good. It was Michigan? In the upper peninsula of Michigan, and it was so easy. My brother-in-law and I had packed in six miles <coughs> and camped on a little creek, and opening day, which was the next day, I walked up this little creek, came down to the canyon, and I hadn't gone more than a quarter of a mile, so I saw the buck, he was maybe 80 yards up there, and he saw me about the same time. And he was looking at me when I shot him, and he piled up, and he was a magnificent animal, and it took us a half a day to drag him out of the canyon. You know, that's a lot of meat. Yeah. We'd dig ourselves in, and one, two, three, and give a little oh, food, wow. and we'd get another thing in. You don't know, so, so anyhow, yeah, I decided next year that uh, maybe that was a little bit too easy, and uh, so I Well, how long pressure. was season back then? Fifteen you'd, days was and you and you and you had took off a whole week's vacation or something. No, we're going for the fifteen days. Fifteen, and the first day you're done. I'm yeah. not finished yet. Yes. As a gun hunter. And next day, my brother and I shot a spike on, and uh, that was it. Had to load up and six miles out to pack it all out. All the fun, yeah. yeah. Was yeah. that one of the early gun seasons in Michigan, or no? They the gun season, gun? as long as I remember, from back to when I was a kid, well, eighteen twenty. I guess the deer hunting season was November the 15th to the end of 
Yeah. Ooh, that's a good time. November 15th in Upper the Michigan. The best time, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. The, the, the horns are moving around. Then. Yeah. yeah. The yeah. horns are horny. Yeah. Well, back then, uh, uh, Fred, uh, uh, archery was just something that people uh, sort of sniggered at. They laughed at. They didn't really take it too serious because their and the equipment was, was in bad shape at that time. Well, yeah. In the first archery season in Michigan, 1937, we had 193 bow hunters. The, the, whole state, state. the whole year. The whole state, the whole year. And really, uh, in 1945, I wanted to go up and uh, moose hunt in Canada. And I wrote to Outfitters who advertised, you know, in the outdoor magazine. And when they found out that I was coming over to hunt with the bow, they were filled up. There was no space. I thought. So I finally said to my partner who was going to go with me, I said, I'm going to mention the bow and we're going to get a place. So we did. We wrapped the bows up in a big tarp. <laughs> with rope around him. We got into camp and met the outfitter and we each had a guide, an Englishman and a, and a, and a Frenchman. And uh, we were to go two days by canoe and motor north into the moose country. The only way you get there, you know, on portages and the whole thing. We never opened up the equipment until we got into camp. <laughs> And you shouldn't see those faces because, you know, well, a guide is sort of rated on how much game is his guest gets. Right. And his, they're going to have a zero record. They can see that right off. <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't turn us, send us back. And uh, we made a drive one day. Or they made a drive. That we were on the mainland and they took a canoe and went out and drove a peninsula. And a buck there. A pretty nice buck came running off. <coughs> and I shot the thing. Came in by me. He dropped about 100 yards over there. And finally, the boys came through in the drive, and, <clears throat> well, you see anything? And I said, uh, you know, I just stood deer laying over there. <laughs> they walked over, and, <coughs> and, and they couldn't understand. They said, my God, no shooting or nothing. <coughs> they couldn't understand. I think it'd be dead without hearing a shot. No <laughs> shooting or nothing. And from there on, they're pretty sold on it. We hung with them a couple of years. You know, you hunting all over the world and everything, and you look back and you see you some of the greatest experience. I know when you killed a world record sheep, that was a, a, a great yeah, accomplishment. But the bear, you're just like your name is bear. You've always told me that your favorite game. I like to hunt bear. bear. Yeah, I did. Yeah. One time uh, I was hunting on the Alaskan Peninsula. I had Bob Munger with me. He was. He pinched. I used to make my own films. I didn't. Couldn't afford a camera underneath back in those days. And I was a cameraman. When I was in the picture, he pinched it for me. I know the feeling, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so uh, we've been on this trip, and uh, actually, we were overdue. We had a boat. Uh, Ed Bilderberg had a 57-foot fishing boat. My gosh, you could put three cars in the tail. She's going to crap. And uh, <clears throat> the hunt was over as far as our allotted time was, except I didn't have a bear. And uh, <clears throat> I'm kind of stubborn like that. And uh, I stayed on, and, but Bob had to go home. He had reasons to go home. And so <clears throat> we dropped him off in Kodiak and went back to the peninsula. And uh, <clears throat> the very next day, we were out cruising around. We had the boat anchored. We'd go on shore in a skiff. We were cruising around, and we saw a, a uh, beautiful brown bear on the beach uh, across a bay. And, uh, he was uh, really having a good time. It was May, and it was a warm day, and the sun made him kind of sleepy. Did the bear see you? No, we were too far away. We saw him first, and uh, he would wade out, and he would submerge and roll all over, sometimes with his feet in the air. He was having a ball. Well, <clears throat> okay, we had to cross the bay. The bay was a quarter of a mile across there, maybe a quarter. We couldn't start the engine, because you hear it. And we had uh, Ed Bilderbeck, he was our guide, and then we had a, uh, a second guide, Harley King, and <clears throat> uh, Harley had never run a camera, but he was along, and on this... You were fixing to make him a cameraman then? Well, I had the time, from, Harley had never taken a picture, with, I don't think even with a brownie camera, and, uh, I, but I had that time to instruct him on this camera, and this camera I had, it was a Cine Special mounted on a stock with sport finders on it, which is a peephole and a frame to get mm -hmm. the no optical stuff. And uh, I had a three inch lens on it, which I thought was about right for my 
shooting position, which I hope would be not more than 40 yards. <clears throat> and I told him, how oh, this is the trigger. When when I wave, give you a hand motion, you start the camera. Uh -huh. And you keep mm -hmm. it running as long as it'll run. What would they run back at about three minutes, five yeah. minutes? Um, 40, uh, 40 feet it ran. Oh, okay. I don't okay. know the time, but it was pretty good time. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> that was, uh, yeah, it seemed special. And uh, I also had a, a Robot Royal, a 35 millimeter Robot Royal sequence camera mounted to the bottom side of the stock that covered the same frame as the movie camera. Uh -huh. And on the end of the stock, it was a push button that actuated that. It was a spring wind, but it would run about 15 off, click, 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 click. So I said, you, when, when, when I give you the, the signal, you hold this camera back, and it's just as long as it will run, as long as you got anything to look at. And when the action starts, when I pull my bow back, push that one. So, <laughs> and really, and he did a beautiful job. The framing was tight. I'd say he did. I've seen that footage. Look at this. All right, he's a, he's a gunman, you know, and he was down on the knee, and he's like this, and he did a beautiful job on that, and the, um, he was 40 yards behind us, and that was just about the right place for him. And after, I let the bear get a little by me first to make sure he was not heading my way. <laughs> <laughs> but look at, he's looking at you right now. Look at the footage. That bear right. looked at you. And then, secondly, was because it's better in for, with an arrow to get it in from behind the front leg. Yeah, right. And rain forward so you get a good killing shot. Okay. I shot the, the uh, bear, and the bear... That, he was sleepy. He didn't know there was anybody there. We were in camouflage clothes. He didn't know there was anything, and here we were 20 feet apart. But this owl kind of woke him up, and he took off, and he's running right towards Harley. When I made sure when, <laughs> that the bear wasn't going to get after me and was headed towards Harley, then I looked down there, and Harley had this camera. It weighed 14 pounds, the movie and the, the other one. And in one hand, and he had a 270 rifle with him all the time. And he was jumping up and down, and he thought he was running, but he wasn't. And the bear detoured around, and the bear got his feet wet going in the water to detour around. <laughs> the bear ran about 70 yards, or 60, and fell dead and just at the edge of the beach in the rock. My heaven. Yeah. That's you know, that's number two Pope and Young, isn't it, that bear? No. Yes, that's number two. I have number one, of course. Yes, but you have number both two. number one and number two. I didn't two. get a picture that was of number one because uh, it was raining in late June. Mm -hmm. Well, you told well, me the only, the only bad encounter that you ever had with a bear. Remember, I was down staying with you one time about four or five years ago, and you had to get up and go to the bathroom at night, and I heard you thrashing around on the floor and all, and the, the bear that you got in the rug, when you <clears throat> walked through, you stuck your foot in his mouth, and it broke your big toe. Am I right, Fred? Well, I, 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 I went a polar bear hunt. You know, my name is Bear, and uh, I had trouble getting a polar bear, and I didn't want to go to my grave without getting all the bears. And the polar bear is the only one that didn't have. And I had to make two trips and didn't get a bear. I got an arrow in them, and they want to eat me up, and the Eskimos would kill them. Mm -hmm. No, ain't you glad the Eskimos did shoot them, though? Well, yeah, but I, I have the trophy because I can't accept anything with a bullet there, and I'm hunting with a bull and arrow. So yeah. I had to finally make three trips. Yeah, and I got this bear. And one of those bears that was shot with a run, I had it mounted in the rug with an open mouth. We have it in the bedroom at home. And uh, that was in 1960, I believe, I shot that one. And for all these years, up until two years ago, I got up out of bed one night to go to the bathroom and coming back, forgot all about the bear, and I stuck my finger in my, or my uh, foot in his mouth and broke a toe. And <laughs> That's I, called I a him. payback. He finally got, got <laughs> even with me. <laughs> all right. You call that getting even. Bob and Ben, we're Liberty Rugged Outdoor Gear. It's worth hunting for. Many recent research results from the premier wildlife biologists in both fields, whitetail and black bear, are disclosed for the first time. The licking branch behavior, for instance, is disclosed on the whitetail chemical communications tape. Advanced deer calling and rattling techniques includes not only rattling, but vocalizations recorded by biologists at the University of Georgia and by myself in my hunting all throughout whitetail habitat. Whitetail trophy hunting tips includes all of my setup requirements, 
and explains exactly how I go about scrape hunting when there is a lot of competitive hunting pressure. The bear baiting techniques from my book, Black Bear is a Technical and Hunting Guidebook, describe all of the detail. My favorite recent tape is Black Bear Trophy Hunting Secrets. I combine talent with Larry D. Jones. Larry does some calling of black bears, and his techniques are detailed. Black Bears, a technical and hunting guidebook. Included in this book are sections on educating a bear hunter, life history of the black bear, the latest scientific understandings of bear behavior and physiology, planning your hunt, the ways of a bear, advanced bear baiting techniques. I believe that I've experimented with various bear baiting techniques as much as any other person. All of my secrets are revealed. Advanced Whitetail Hunting Techniques, my dear book, Learn to Make Mock Scrapes by the inventor of the technique. Since I coined the term mock scrapes in an article about five years ago, a lot of other writers have picked up on the technique. Yeah. Hey, I want to ask you, fellas. You spent a lot of time with deer, and I know Ben has. Uh, one time, quite a few years ago, in the upper peninsula of Michigan, I was up there hunting with the gang of fellas in the rutting season, about the middle of November. And I came upon a buck and a doe that were, you know, getting kind of friendly. And we're playing together. Yes. <laughs> but the buck ran off, but the doe didn't. The hackles and the, her back and neck went up, and their ears laid back. And I walked right up to her from here, closer than to from here, where the camera was, and I was afraid to go any closer. I think I know what that was. Was she arched back at the time? I, it, I, I, I think I really I've just made I it. have movies of that. That's a post-copulation arch. You barely miss seeing it, Fred. Well, I swear, right. for what 10 happened? to 12 minutes, a doe, if, if there's a su successful copulation, yeah. uh, following the penal thrust, she stands and quivers, and her, she has abdominal uh, contractions, and her back is arched, and the hair will stand up down her backbone, and if you walk up to her, you can almost touch that doe, and she'll look at you kind of funny. The buck will run, but she'll stand there for 10 to 12 minutes well, after copulation. No, no, there's no. a selective advantage to maximize the odds that the dominant buck fertilizes the egg. She, there's two things that happen. The doe will not stand until about the time of ovulation, and that means she leaves a lot of scent in the woods, gives the big buck a chance to find her, and then the first copulation, the second advantage is, the first, uh, the first successful insertion amounts to successful breeding, that is the edge of her lies, because she'll stand in place like you observe, and abdominal contractions will pull the semen within her to maximize the odds that the dominant buck who was with her when she finally stood is the one to successfully fertilize the eggs. What you saw, I'll bet, was a post-copulation arch of a doe, and that's a rarely observed behavior. Well, you know what I thought? When she did move off, she acted like her hindquarters were partly paralyzed. Yeah. And I yeah. said to myself, maybe that's it. Maybe they run them to a point, maybe it's body temperature, whatever it is, until they, they, their end freezes up. Well, but... There may have been something wrong with her. No, nobody no, knows, no, even if you'd been there. But that's not that's not normal for the right. breeding. Now, there's a very strange thing. I don't ever saw it once. But a very strange thing. A friend of mine who was with this party saw the same thing four or five days before me, and I didn't believe him. But it's during the peak of the rut now when this was going, when this happened? Oh, it was in the middle. middle yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I, you know, when I was growing up on the farm as a boy, and we had a lot of cows in the pasture, and you could notice a cow when she was in season, and a bull and her would mate, and when it was through, she would stand there all drawn up and just shaking, and she would be stove up, and then I, she'd limber up, but she'd stand there for a while, and what's happened, her body is seeking to absorb and to pull up is that right? to fertilize them eggs, and that's exactly what happened. Well, I'm glad. I believe you saw it. Well, I'm glad to find somebody who can tell me something about it. Yeah, yeah, I have filmed it. I'll leave a, a videotape that I have shot oh, at really? the University of Georgia and elsewhere. I, I filmed the event of copulation 12 times, yeah. and that is a typical behavior. A lot of people, the tending buck stays with the doe for well, a long time off. after the mount, he but off. if it's a true copulation, on, on all but one occasion that I've personally witnessed a real copulation, the buck quickly abandoned the doe. And there's an advantage to the species. He's out looking for another hot number. The doe's behavior is the only truthful indicator of a successful insertion.
And that's when she and stands that's the over there and just her. arches her back. All right, that's I the got one more question then. I saw, one time, a young buck, a spike one, was a little horny with the doll. This was an early rut. But he didn't know where it was. He was on her sideways and front ways and every other way. Although that probably was just an inexperienced buck. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you something else about the inexperienced buck like that, Fred. He'll chase that doe and runner wide open through the woods. I mean, That's you'll right. hear him coming for 200, 300 yards. Yeah. And an old buck, you'll see the doe walking along, and he'll be about 25 or 30 yards behind her just walking. He knows that she's not going right. to stand for 24 hours after she starts leaving that scent. And he is not going to push her and run her. But that young buck is like we were when we were 17, 18 years old. We're going <laughs> to run wide open. But they still wanted it. He would yeah. fall off, and she just stepped over a couple of steps and uh, wait for me. Yeah, I have filmed but Dad, bucks didn't trying to... The young kid. <laughs> well, I don't know. The, the, the bucks often observe other bucks breeding and may acquire some of the necessary habits by observation, yeah. but it's more, it's more likely that they acquire it naturally. That it's, Instinctively. Uh, yeah, it's an it's instinctively instinct. inherited trait. They know automatically how to do it. They're, well, Fred, yeah, okay. it's, what been, it's been a great time here today. It has yeah, been. Yeah, I've really got, enjoyed got, this. We got something here that I know you've promoted from ever since you went in the archery business, and that's promoting kids around yeah, the country, teaching gonna, conservation in hunting. Right, we got them in to the, get them in the camp out in the woods with good companions and show them how to do everything right. Because well, I think it, one, the ethical. That's yes. that's the only way to go. Okay. Hey, where's and this guy, Danny? Though? We got Danny. We, we have, have a we kid here to fix him. Danny. Up. Danny, this is Fred Bear, Mr. Well, we, Bear. We met, this we is didn't Danny. Shake him. Yeah. And this one's hey, particular interest to me. Well, got this is here. mine. This is Danny McGuire. Well, all right, Danny. Danny, you, you have, have a boy, Do you have a boat? No, you don't. He's been asking for a month, and I have been a bad father for the last month, promising him. We've been looking for a little bow that would fit this child, and there, Mr. Bear has one well, with his name. A real compound, too. This is what we got here, just what... Uh, what he's looking for. Boy, I'd say, Danny, okay. look at that. Now, yeah, well, it's going to be right my fault. Yes, he is. Okay, you hold it in that hand, like that. And you pull this. Pull That's it. That's it. Yeah. See? Now then, let's pull see. It back. Pull it back. Yeah, okay. Help him pull it back a little bit. Well, look at that. Look at well, that. Can he can pull, pull that. that. Yeah. Sure. You want to shoot an arrow? Would you like you to want to go over and shoot an Let's go over and do one. We've got some arrows here and a bow. And we're going to start my kid off. Fred, right. y'all are y'all are working programs all over the country with kids today, aren't you? Yeah, well, that's yeah, the good we go part about it. Kids. Yeah, teach them. Keep them off the streets. You put that on there. You hold your hand just the way you were holding it. That's the way. Put that on there. And then you put the no. Now your hand goes no. Open your hand. Your arrow goes between like that. And then you pull that back, and you. Aim it at the target and let it go. But we, it's going to be a little while, you know. It's kind of hard the first time. That's right. Now you pull that back. Way back. Now. Okay, let go. Well, look at it. Well, that was pretty close, wasn't it? One more, and now you're going to get it this time. Right in the middle. Right? Right. Okay. All right, you grab it there. Pull it back. Yeah. Oh, it's falling off. <laughs> well, that goes like that, you know. Oh, archery's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. You're a pretty good guy, too. Now, you got to pull it way back. Way back. Oh, way back. Okay, let it go. Oh, right in the middle. Congratulations. Nice going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to get the arrows? Again. You want to shoot that again? Well, it gets in your blood, you know. I've produced five videotapes for the hunters, including three on whitetail deer hunting, one on turkey, and one on black bear hunting. The first deer tape is Understanding the Whitetail Rut is a 30-minute video which includes rare movies of deer rut behavior that I've filmed over the past few years, including scraping, pheromone scent marking, sparring, fighting, you learn a big distinction between sparring and fighting, tending of estrus does by dominant bucks, chasing of subordinates, including breeding the full rut scenario. 
My favorite deer tape is advanced whitetail hunting techniques. This is 48 minutes of hunting how-to, including wind techniques, mock scraping techniques I've developed through the years, my favorite setups, how to scout for big bucks, licking branch behavior. I show movies of actual deer at licking branches throughout the year. And I also include a successful deer hunt with no feather. In my deer calling video, I teach you the complex vocabulary of the whitetail, how to make the sounds, when to make them, how to mix vocalizations with rattling techniques, how to call in does, which come from an extraordinary distance at a dead run if you use the right sound, even how to call tending bucks, dominant bucks, and more. In my black bear hunting tape, 25 minutes of action-packed how-to adventure, I teach you the secrets of how to locate bait sites, how to construct the baits legal in various locales, the bait contents. In my turkey hunting adventure with Ben Rogers Lee in Alabama, we show you together how to call hunting equipment, the techniques, scouting and turkey signs, and we go through an actual bow hunt for Alabama gobblers.